finally we're ready to start. Hey. Okay, if you hear people yelling here or there, they're not far speakers, they're from the game. That's what game is going on, so we'll have to deal with that. So I'll give the brief introduction and then I'll introduce our teacher speaker. So first I introduce who we are and what we do. So we're called Silicon Valley Science Fiction Society, and we're um, we're not inviting science fiction authors. What we invite is people, like scientists and like businessmen, who do what is thought to be a science fiction, which actually right now becomes real. So let me give you an example of our previous talks. If I can try this one. So. We had uh, one of our first speakers was uh, uh, from Berkeley, Dr. Z. G. Wong, and he actually invented the real invisibility clock. It's at the very nano level, and I mean, it's obviously small, and he is a professor of materials, but it is actually a real invisibility clock. Then we had um, a businessman. Adam Curry. So he, and this was actually a controversial talk, he created an app which is trying to prove that something which is called collective conscience exists, which means that whatever I think and whatever you think, there is something collective. And he wrote an app trying to prove that there is some collective one. He said it was controversial, but he presented it and we even did an experiment, which did work. <laughs> And we definitely, again, one of our biggest, I think, talks, and um, again, a little bit controversial, was from Purdue, came uh, Dr. Tom Feng Lee. And even though he hates the word teleportation, uh, what he did was actually, he's doing an experiment of uh, putting a living organism in two places at the same time. Not a copy of an organism, but the actual organism in two places at the same time, like a quantum superposition of the organism. Uh, it's a very small, the smallest organism you can find, but that's what he's doing, and he talked about it. And of course, our biggest talk was uh, the international superstar, Dr. Aubrey de Grey, who is also hates the words immortality, even though that's what most people associate him with, um, who is working on uh, what he's calling reverse, reversing aging, and the sense organization is actually mounting you right here, and that was very impressive. So um, let me give you some examples of what science fiction does on the modern world. Who knows who this guy is? No. Any other guesses? That's a famous science fiction writer, uh, Clark. Exactly. And what he did is he actually wrote about this. Anybody can guess the year? 1968. In 1968, in his book, he described exactly iPad, which then one of the guys from Silicon Valley implemented. Um, even though you cannot see in a very small tin book over there, <laughs> presenting the earbud headphones which we're not going to talk about today, even though people are very controversial. Anyway, who knows who invented earbud headphones? Who knows this guy? Of course, that's Red Bradbury. And he described it in 1953. He totally described how earbud headphones would look like function like and everything in one of his books in 1953. Our feature speaker for today, for the asteroid mining. And who knows who this guy is? Oh, correct. That's Jules Verne. And he actually described it in 1877. So you can see how science fiction has an effect, or should I say it's actually the other way around. People read science fiction books, and this is how they get an idea of what the next step is, especially in Silicon Valley. This is how it works. 
and what we are here trying to prove, and this is why I invite many of our speakers, that if you think something is impossible, there's a lot of examples like time traveling, a lot of examples from science fiction. Right now, we live in a very unique point of time that modern technology and modern level of science allows us, even in a small kind of a portion, to do something like this. And in fact, almost everything is possible. By the way, on the um, time travel, there's guys in uh, Australia who did an experiment and they actually sent a very, very, very small particle into the past. I'm trying to invite them for a talk, but it's not real because they're from Australia. Other speakers are okay. And this is what we do. We're trying to show you how the future is, and we're trying to invite people who are actually making the future. Not science fiction writers who create the future, not people who think what the future will be, but people who are actually making the future today. And that brings us to a future speaker. And we have an upgrade for you guys. So instead of the chief engineer, we actually have the CEO of Deep Space Industries, Daniel Faber. Daniel? I'm going to cheat and just ask to run a video as a uh, as a way to introduce uh, deep space industries and uh, and some of the things that we do. Deep space industries is on a quest to open the solar system using the resources of space in space. To begin this quest, we are launching Prospector X to demonstrate our revolutionary yet rugged PSI technologies in lower orbit. Working with our partners in the government of Luxembourg, this tiny spacecraft will usher in a new era of clean space propulsion systems that are not only simple, but begin to build the deep space ecosystem of the future, as it uses longer one of the many resources we intend to harvest in space. Prospector X will improve our systems and technologies, preparing the way for the next step, Prospector 1, our first mission to an asteroid. Once launched into low Earth orbit, P1 will use a dedicated small rocket booster to begin its voyage to our target. As it approaches the target, P1 will fire its water thrusters to rendezvous. From increasingly closer distances, P1 will carefully study and map the abundance of water on the target. Once this survey is completed, the information will be sent back to deep space operators, allowing us to begin to put together an assessment of the asteroid's makeup. Finally, P1 will then land on the asteroid. This final maneuver will allow our science team to understand the asteroid's geotechnical characteristics, what miners call its diggability. Most importantly, by its physical contact, P1 will establish the first commercial base on a space object. And from its new foothold, P1 will, at least for a while, broadcast its location, allowing deep space control to keep tabs on our first active research outpost. From this small beginning, Prospector 1 will set the stage for an expanded exploration of the possible asteroid targets, even as it places the trail for our next spacecraft systems, the harvesters, that will voyage up to targets in space, and utilizing the resources they find there, process their own propellant to return our first payloads to our near Earth facilities, just in time to supply and service a new wave of customers, from satellite operators to those building new facilities in space, from explorers to entrepreneurs, scientists to settlers, and all who are now stepping up and out into the high frontier. It has been said that if you can dream it, you can do it, and so we are. We are deep space industries. It's not just our name, it's what we do. So that's it for the uh, for the slideshow. Uh, everything else is me.
you anymore. Um, let's see. January 21st, 2009, I got fired. Um, yeah, January 1st, 21st, 2009. Um, I got fired by the CEO that I hired to run my first startup company. Um, he also fired himself and everybody else. Uh, we, we just developed an instrument and proof that, uh, that we could do a geotechnical assay of a, or a geochemical assay of a, of a rock you know, in a nice box that, that all of the mining companies seemed to want. And then the world ran out of money. Um, that, was, that was a pretty, pretty bad day. Let me tell you how I got to that point and, uh, and then how I ended up here. So um, who's, uh, who's studying at Stanford at the moment? A few hands. Is anyone in uh, in first year? No. All right. You have to think back then to your first year or forward. If you have to. Not quite got there yet. Um, in first year, I was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and uh, I was in Sydney in Australia, and trying to figure out what I do, what I wanted to do. And uh, and my parents, they they had a wall of science fiction, so I'd read through all of that, and then I'd read through everything at the library. And I discovered that they had computer terminals, so I could hack those and get books shipped to me from other libraries. And um, I think I'd almost run out of science fiction by the time I got to university. But I still didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew that uh, I'd like to do something useful for the world, because we all do. Um, I wanted to do something that, uh, that was going to keep me interested. Um, and I, I started to, to look around at, uh, at what the options were to spend my career on. And uh, I realized that addressing existential risks was, was uh, a thing that, that just made sense to me. I always had a, a long-term view of the world. And when you look forward 100 years or 1,000 years, the only thing that makes sense to do is to work on existential risks. And getting people off this rock could address a lot of those existential risks. So I made a list of all the things that could possibly pay for the first permanent job in orbit. And none of these little six-month NASA holidays. I mean, they're great and we're learning a lot, but that's not going to get us off this rock. We need a, we need a profit motive. We need to, to have something that's going to pay so that we can blow the top off this long term and really get people off this rock. And to do that, we have to have the first job. So my list of, of all the industries that could possibly afford to keep somebody off Earth, this is first year undergrad, so I took a guess at how much that was, and there were three things on the list. It was space-based solar power, mining, and tourism. And I quickly realized that you really needed mining for space-based solar power, and I couldn't see myself as a tour operator. So then in first year undergrad, I got a bunch of people together and asked why spacecraft was so expensive and decided to try to build one and, and started on a, on a very chaotic career. Uh, it, it ended up with me running into some very amazing people. Um, I, I met uh, at, a, at a conference in, uh, in Ames um, many years ago now, John Lewis, who, who wrote the book on asteroid resources. And that, that got me really looking at, at asteroids. And that was, that was very opening. I, I ran into a, uh, a few guys uh, some years before that who were doing orbital, orbital dynamics and trying to design uh, an asteroid resource mission uh, in Southern California, the company was called uh, Space Dev, and the mission was called Meek, the, the Near Earth Asteroid Prospector. Uh, they weren't able to get that up, but they had a real, a real good go at it. And these were the, the real pioneers uh, in what we're trying to, to do now. Um, and so I've become friends with some of those just because of, of common interest. Um, I ran into a, a lot of these people, and we were all pushing on the same thing. And we're all seeing a long-term goal, but realizing that we had to take those first steps in order to do it. So we came together um, a few years ago, and uh, everybody had had failures along the way. Our chairman put together a team that rented the, uh, the Mir space station, and they were looking at tourist flights. Their long-term goal was actually asteroid mining. Uh, if, you, if you've heard of Mir Corp and, and the story there, uh, it's, a, it's a tragic story of, of a business trying to get off the ground, a lot of people who really believed in it, and it didn't quite make it. And my first startup was doing instrumentation for the mining industry. You've heard how that went. You get to that kind of a day and you think, what the hell am I doing here? Why am I, why am I bothering with this? There are easier ways to make money in the world than that. And then you get up the next morning and you do it again. Um, our, our founding uh, CEO had, uh, had started three or four different um, entrepreneurial space companies. And, uh, and, and each time he got, a, he got a certain way, he learned a lot. And then uh, had, had not been able to take them further. So we get to this point where we're all trying to move things in the same direction. What we realized a few years ago was that things have changed. 
where we were we were avoiding the topic of asteroid mining before, unless you were John Lewis and you wrote the book on the, the resources and had a great career in, in geology and science. Everyone else had been skirting around this topic, putting it in the last lines of the business plan as something they wanted to do, um, or, or chatting about it at conferences as, as you know, an interesting thing that we were looking at. <clears throat> but the world that we live in now, we've got companies for which on orbit servicing is a core business, big aerospace companies. We've got companies whose, whose primary goal was to, to print things in space. 3D printers are, are now you know, very much a, a part of the industry and, uh, and of manufacturing. And we're, we're looking at moving those and, and uh, a lot of companies are looking at what they can do with those in space. There's companies that are that are talking about and refining space-based solar panels. That's still not there yet. We'll, we'll get to that soon. But uh, there are other people who are who are looking at different parts of, uh, of this ecosystem, at the supply of propellants and all, uh, coming up with architectures uh, the United Launch Alliance, uh, Boeing and Lockheed joint venture, um, that's the, the biggest launch company in the, in the US, they, uh, their, their architecture to put a thousand people living in space in 2035, 2040, something like that. Uh, and it requires, uh, in its very early stages, the refueling of their upper stage of their launch people by material in a thought, uh, in their case, hydrogen and oxygen. All of these things are converging. All of these things are accelerated and enabled by having a supply of materials in space. But our problem right now is that it costs so much. It costs five or ten million dollars per ton to get material into space. This is this is the tragic nature of the of, uh, of where we're at. It's amazing that we that we do anything. The space industry is a three hundred thirty billion dollar a year business. Three hundred thirty billion dollars a year on the back of of a location that takes five to ten million dollars per ton to get material back. If it cost that amount of money to get material to Australia, I wouldn't have this accent. <laughs> and it's, it's horrendous, it's amazing. So, uh, and Elon Musk, uh, the other companies, uh, Blue Origin, they're looking at reducing uh, the amount that that costs. They, they might be successful in bringing down by an order of magnitude, I and mean, that's amazing. You drop the price by 90%, and it will still be hundreds of thousands of dollars per time. That's why we need the resources that are, that are up there. That's how we completely change the picture. So there are three, three ways that people attack them. One, make cheaper rockets. The second, get materials up there. The third is build really, really small spacecraft so you can get more capability out of it, and then we'll do a lot more. Unfortunately for humanity, there's kind of a size limit. For those of us who happen to be six foot seven, it's a rather annoying size limit. Um, so we need to have some ability to, to bring up um, something that's, that's perhaps human scale. But there's also uh, a lot of advantages from economies of scale. You want a really big um, reflector if you if you want to run a comms network. You want a really big solar collection area if you want to gather solar power. And at the moment, the, the comms antennas are limited to three or four meters across because that's the size of the, the rocket pair. And the solar arrays, we're getting up now to tens of kilowatts, and people are dreaming of a 100 kilowatt solar array for, uh, for a communication satellite or the big ones for NASA's deep space missions. And if we had a 100 meter diameter concentrator, we'd be bringing tens of megawatts, not tens of kilowatts. And what's stopping us is we just can't launch that material. So that's what we can do if we get material out of it. So we've been looking at this for a while. Um, a lot of us have had um, you know, some, some good efforts at building some of the related companies, some of the related technologies. We've built up a lot of knowledge. We've got a convergence in the industry of various different technologies. People are being successful, and there's a lot of money now going into the space industry. Uh, based, uh, some of it in recent years because of, of the need for, for big data, the demands of, uh, of big data, and the shrinking of satellites, so the capex, uh, for the capital cost of, of starting uh, a space company and putting spacecraft into orbit and, and testing markets has shrunk considerably. All these things now, we're on the tipping point of being able to really just blow the top off where we're at with the space industry. And so that's where Deep Space Industries is coming in. Our goal is not so much to, to vertically integrate and win this, this market and, and build it all ourselves, because people who built bits of this already. Our goal is to organize and coordinate. We see this, this ecosystem with people who are building rockets and can be serviced, that are building servicing equipment that are building 3D printers. But there's a gap 
in propulsion systems that can use the propellant that comes from an asteroid. So we built a tiny little propulsion system that runs on water. Because water we can get out of asteroids. Now, step back. Um, a lot of people have, have thought about platinum and, and um, those kind of high value materials to get those from asteroids. We did a lot of economic analysis on that. Let me just tell you it's a non -star. Um, the, the very quickly in the economics. Uh, on Earth, if you've got uh, one part per million of platinum, one gram per ton, um, you can probably start a mine if it's near the surface and near some infrastructure. If you've got 10 grams per ton, that's an incredibly rich ore body, and you could go underground and mine that. Um, on the asteroids, we have 30 grams per ton. It's not an uncommon number. In fact, some of the, the meteorites that we have as, as samples have up to 200 grams per ton of platinum. Now that's fantastic. The contained platinum value is several thousand dollars per ton of asteroid material. But that doesn't close the business case. If you look at water and consider that we might sell that for half or maybe ten percent of a launch cost, something like that. And the asteroids, there, there are a lot of asteroids and samples that we have that are containing 10 and even 20% water by weight. The contained mineral value of that water is hundreds of thousands of dollars up to a million dollars per ton, compared to the platinum at several thousand dollars per ton. And platinum is really hard to extract. It is a really difficult process to get platinum out of things. Water is pretty easy when I mean, you heat stuff up and water comes out. It's, it's a little more difficult than that, but it's definitely a hell of a lot easier than platinum. So we're after the easy thing that's worth a lot. One day we'll create these byproducts, perhaps, and we'll ship them down to the earth. But all of our products are looking to supply an in orbit market. We're not looking to bring anything to the ground. That's where we start. So we start with water, then hydrocarbons, which we can turn into plastic for 3D printers, uh, nickel and iron in abundance, which again, 3D printers, manufacturing, that's what we're going to build the, uh, the, the large um, solar concentrators and radio dishes and tanks and structures in space to, to really enhance the existing markets. That's the material that we're going to build the space stations and the hotels and the stadiums that run the first Olympics. That's the material that we're going to use to build the cities in space. Deep space industry's goal in 30 years is to provide the equipment and material needed to build cities in space. That is where we go. And we bootstrap that by building a really small trust of the on the wall because we can sell that today. Then we build a bigger one and a better one. We need a thruster that can return material from the asteroid. And if you don't, if you don't get propellant from the asteroid, you're not going to bring much back. It takes a lot of fuel. So we have to use a propellant that we can extract from the asteroid. We need to put so much propellant through that thruster. It's going to move thousands of tons of material back to Earth orbit. That's a bigger thruster in terms of total impulse and, and push than any thruster that's ever been built before. That's our development part. And we start with this tiny little thing because that's what the market is. Then we move to the next thing and the next thing, and we build that up. So that's the, that's the path we're going. A whole bunch of other technologies. Those technologies we sell. The future is always there driving that, that, those technologies. We go out and we saw the, the video of Prospect 1. We run that mission. We've now got a resource assessment in hand. We go to the mining industry and say, we have this resource assessment. The international community and, and uh, led by the US government is passing laws that, uh, that talk about uh, the right to own material extract and uh, the possibility of secure tenure of an area that, that you're investing in to, to understand what that material is. You take that secure tenure and your knowledge of that material to the mining markets. They understand mining risk. They understand mining you know, geology risk. Um, but they don't understand technology risk. So we go to NASA, we go to the European Space Agency and say, here's our roadmap. Here is where the, the distributors of communication services see their market in 10 or 15 years. Here's where the um, contact operators, this is what they need in order to win that market. They could be enabled by these resources. Here's what satellite manufacturers, SSL down the road, Boeing, Lockheed, Airbus, here's what they need to provide in order to fit with that material and solve that customer's problem. Here's the technology we need to build. The governments are really good at putting money into technology. The VCs in Silicon Valley are really good at putting money into markets. You've got a technology that works. The investors in Toronto and, and Sydney, in Canada and Australia, are really good at putting money in when you don't quite know what your geology is. So you go to the right people, divide up the risk into what they have an appetite for, and then work through to a to complete business. This is part of our end-to-end, -end, how do we manage this ecosystem to, to, to create it? 
And how do we fill the gaps that are missing? So if we can find a provider that, that, that had waters that were thrusters that could run on water, there's no way we could into that market. If we're missing, we step in and create that. If we can't find a, a manufacturer of a, of a printer that can use nickel and iron and print in microgravity, step in and build that. Find one, or buy one. If there's anything missing. But can the outputs of one uh, match with the inputs of the other? So the geologists who are, who are looking to, um, and planetary, uh, planetary geologists, planetary scientists, who are looking to, uh, to find out about the origins and evolution of the, uh, the solar system. And the, the missions from um, you know, Hayabusa, uh, Rosetta, uh, Osiris-Rex, which just launched, uh, Hayabusa 2, which, uh, which launched six months ago. These, these missions are going to be out with science questions. The outputs from those questions are really helpful for the geologists. They, they reduce that geological risk. But they don't answer the questions that a mining engineer needs answered. They don't tell you about diggability in rock mechanics. You saw that mentioned on that video for a reason. If I try and stick a shovel into the dirt on an asteroid and it bounces off, I'm in trouble. But if I stick it in, it's all fluffy. I pull the shovel out and everything just flows off. I'm also in trouble. Okay, I've got to be able to design my equipment to the conditions that are on the asteroid. So can we put those questions into the minds of the scientists? Can we piggyback our instruments on the mission? We couldn't see that, so we're doing our own mission. But then, of course, we can turn that around and ask the science, what would you like to know? Here's the space that we have. Here's the instruments that we have. Here's the data that we'll get. We could use a hand mapping this. We could use a hand with the spectral characterization. I think we did spectral characterization of the, uh, uh, of the asteroids before we get there. We've got great discovery rates on, uh, on near-Earth asteroids. We have telescopes on the ground that can get a spectral characterization but we're not dedicating them to that task. So our database has a bit of a, a life bit. That's something that scientists are interested in. That we can then go to the government and say, look, here's a, here's a commercial path, and here's why this is needed in 10 or 15 years, or because it's an input to the prospecting, it's needed even sooner. Can you help us out with, with a science question? That's how we're, we're sort of starting to, uh, to organize this ecosystem. So that gives you an idea of, of how the database industry is, is working on things. So the path from, from reading a lot of science fiction, to, uh, to deciding that, that this is something that we can achieve and, and I might as well have a go at it, uh, which are, a lot of people have uh, done, to, to finding all of these people like-minded who are working on different bits of the problem and, uh, and managing to, to surround myself with, with geniuses. Uh, it's just, and, and then putting all of this together in a business model that seems to make sense, uh, it's, it's been an interesting ride. It's, it's resulted in a lot of moments where I wanted to quit, uh, where it made sense to quit, and I didn't. Um, and everyone on our team is, is in that. Um, so to everybody here, um, this is one problem. What, we, what, I've, what I've laid out is the path that the deep space industry is going down. It's, it's my personal path. It's, it's the personal path of, uh, of everyone in our team. But there is so much that needs to be done, from the, the, the on-over printing and servicing to finding a new business model is one of the most crucial things. How do we grow that market? To, uh, to putting together a lower cost spacecraft at larger scale. Um, to figuring out how we're going to live, to, to get the tourism industry off the ground. One of my realizations about uh, a few years ago, I'm, I'm a little slow, probably only a year and a half ago, was that we were going to lose the race. The miners are not going to be able to, to create that first permanent job. Model. It's going to be the tourism guys. We get up there. You have to have somebody open the door. You have to have somebody with like a fresh baked loaf of bread who flips you around and teaches you how to do the zero do you think it's part of the experience. For mining, it's all robots. It's robots until it gets so complicated that you need a human to step in. And, uh, and when it becomes cheaper to do that, we'll, we'll be able to put people up there. We'll be able to afford to put people up there because we've built a substantial infrastructure and, and a company already. But what we can do is enable those tourists. We can enable the tour operators. NASA's buying water from the International Space Station for $10 million a ton. Now, they can only buy that at one ton of it because that's all the company that has that equipment can supply from the waste product they get uh, from NASA. Um, but that's, that's something that, that we can bring to the asteroids. Would you like a swimming pool as part of your experience? Can you imagine this sphere of water? Kind of wobbling around, you blow a bubble in the middle of it, 
You sit in the middle of the bubble, in the middle of the bubble, sipping your martini from your funky zero gravity glass, looking at the Earth and the Moon, it's kind of shimmering out there. I, I want that experience. A swimming pool, an Olympic-sized swimming pool, contains 25,000 tons of water. But what am I going to bring it back for you? Tell me how much that experience is worth. Tell me how many tickets you think you can sell. Tell me what price I've got to hit. And I've got this curve that says how long is it going to take until we can get the price down to that point. And I'll tell you what year we should start going on that business. What else can we do? Yeah, you get the, the first people up there, they're going to want to play sport and try and sell the rights to, uh, um, to the first microgravity sports, all right? Space is a great pool. Everybody wants to see what happens. So you, you manage to sell some TV rights. Now you've got a revenue stream that could justify sending a, a, a professional athlete, which you've just named Stanford professional athlete, to go up and, and play sport. Now you've got something for your tourists to go and see. So now you've got to provide a stadium and, and or at least some seating and a large enough arena and now you start running competition. Now you've started to bootstrap a whole industry up there because you've got people that you need to be up there permanently to make sure this works. You cross the threshold of having those first permanent people and they want to improve their lives. So every step along that way, you're going to need materials. That's what we want to do. That's what we want to help in it. And then in 30 years' time when that's scaled up and we're building cities, I'll come back here and I'll give a talk and I'll tell you about all the other moments that I got fired or that the company almost fell apart because this is going to be a messy process. And there'll be other people who do the same. But you know, maybe I'll invite you up to stand at all the campus and you can do it there. So now I'm going to have a couple of questions and then we're going to open up to questions from you guys, anyone else. So first question, where you are right now, what can you do already with what you started? We're, we're a startup company, all right? We, we have big plans. Um, we are, uh, you, you saw, we're looking to launch a, a CubeSat, a three unit CubeSat, micro like six, um, next year with that propulsion system, optical navigation, power electronics. Um, we've also um, sold a bunch of satellites to commercial customers. Because it turns out that the propulsion system didn't exist. And we spent a year and a half trying to buy a propulsion system for microsats so we could send something to an asteroid. There was nothing we could buy. Um, so that's, that was a, a market opportunity. We, we've got those four launches next year. That's, you know, for us, that's the end of the works. That's the proof that our business model actually has some, uh, something to it. The resource assessment, I mean, that's uh, sort of three years away until we, we get that resource assessment in there. We're then seeing the uh, uh, the results on, on rock mechanics and, and mineralogy verified uh, on the ground on an asteroid. Um, so that's the that mission is already in design. Um, we were looking at uh, passing you know, through some of the, the design reviews. It's using the water thruster, so that's already um, you know, in uh, in testing and shipping flight units at the end of the year. Uh, it's using the optical navigation system that's flying next year. All of these things are converging. So we're already working hard on that mission. As we go beyond that, um, when we start to look at running um, technology demonstrations for, uh, we need to, to reduce, remove the technology risk for extracting the material and for processing that material. So we have a process flow sheet worked out with a lot of test work, and it's all thermal, physical, um, uh, chemical type processes. Uh, and we have to test the processes, and the processes we know on the ground, but we need to test them with asteroid material, we need to test them on orbit with microgravity, and then we'll be satisfied we can go out and actually run a pilot plant on the asteroid. Same with the extractive technologies. So we've got a, a lot of things that we're working on on that. Uh, we're looking for partners on that because uh, a lot of work to be done. Uh, similarly, for Prospect of One, we're still looking for partners on instruments. But um, that's that's a lot of the work that, that we currently do. I'm not sure if that is the question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Answer. Um, now, another question. You kind of mentioned it. Um, so the probably leading person who's trying to set up company on uh, Mars is Elon Musk. How do you see, and you talk about it, did you contact him on how you guys fit into that plan? 
Yeah, so we've, we've chatted with him a bit, and he's not going to baseline what we're doing into his architecture if it's adding more risk. Uh, and he's announced that he's going to, well, he originally announced he was going to Mars in 2026, now he said 2024. Um, I'm always impressed when people try to slide things to the left, we'll see how he goes. The, um, but uh, to, just to, to explain the kind of difference that it could make with what we're doing, a, uh, a Falcon Heavy is supposed to be launching something like 50 tons into, uh, into low Earth orbit. Uh, people here probably know the numbers better than I do. Uh, you put 50 tons into, into Earth orbit, uh, you can probably get about uh, five tons down to the surface of Mars. Something like that. Um, now, that's, that's a decent amount of mass. You can do things with five tons. But if you could fuel up the upper stage in Earth orbit, then you can take 50 tons to Mars orbit. Right? Let's say a whole bunch of that is parachutes and heat shields and what have you. You've got 25 tons on the surface of Mars. That's, that's a substantial building. Now you're, you're talking a real advantage. If you've got an architecture that can do it with five ton modules, then buy yourself a cheaper launch vehicle, save money, accelerate the program. So it makes a huge difference to have just, just propellant, just water, or in, uh, you know, if you're thrusters using hydrogen and oxygen, which is United Launch Alliance, take the water and split it. If your thrusters use methane and oxygen, well, we have hydrocarbons. And that's not a difficult process. We can make uh, methane and oxygen. These are all possible. So we're aware of what Elon's doing. He's aware of what we're doing. Um, we would like to insert ourselves into that architecture, but we need to reach a level of maturity and, and provide a level of certainty before he's going to look up. And yeah, the last question for me. You, you kind of mentioned that, uh, that you're concentrating right now on water and maybe other materials. But does it make economical sense? And do you see a use case for actually mining gold and platinum? And what will it do to the economy if you actually do that? Yeah, so we have a great number of samples of, um, uh, of the asteroids thanks to the meteorites. And because we have reflection spectra, we can match the, about 60% of the asteroid spectra can be matched to one of the 19 um, classes of, of asteroids. That gives us some idea those asteroids have at least a fairly homogeneous surface. You build on that a model that says they have a fairly homogeneous interior, that model needs to be tested. But um, so that lets us, it gives us some, uh, some certainty about what, what is out there and what we can go after. We see the high levels of platinum, I mentioned up to 200 parts per million, though typically around 30. Um, what we don't see is the concentration of gold. The, the mineral concentration mechanisms that, that concentrate gold aren't present in the formation process of the asteroids. And so that's that's a challenge if you want to mine gold. But um, one day, you asked more about the timeline and, and platinum is relevant to the question, and one day we'll, we'll, be, we'll be taking the rocks apart and, uh, and we'll be able to put uh, you know, the, the, the waste product from one step into the next process and et cetera, et cetera, uh, until we have something that's, that's upgraded in concentration of, of platinum and we think, oh, well, we can make some money by tacking a stage on that to bring out platinum. So it makes sense at, at some point. But um, let me try and contextualize what we're doing with um, polymetallic ore bodies in a terrestrial context. Uh, one example of a, of a complex polymetallic ore body is Olympic Dam in, uh, in the middle of Australia. It's the largest underground mine. It's, one of the, it's the largest uranium deposit in the world. It's the largest gold deposit in the world, the third largest copper deposit in the world. It's an enormous deposit, but it's not, not extremely high grade. Um, they, they discovered that deposit by accident, um, completely off geophysics, and, uh, and started work on how they might mine it. And they, think, they spent, I think, 80 years going through different pilot plants and different process mechanisms to extract the minerals from that. It's also one of the largest, did I say rare earth elements? Rare earth element both in the world. So they, they looked at designing with a rare earth element mine. Um, and then they looked at the, as, you know, as having that one of the first things they got out of the process flow sheet, they couldn't close the case. Maybe they did some test work, it didn't, didn't quite work as they hoped. They, they went through different process flow sheets um, over something like eight years until they finally figured out what they had as a copper mine. It's a copper mine that also produces uranium, gold, and silver. And they take the rare earth element and dump it in a daily form. Because it ends up in a, in a mineral or chemical state that we don't have the technology to economically extract. 
One day we will, and they'll hoover up the tailings pond and reprocess it. But it's a copper mine. You know, other things aren't being extracted at, at uh, their optimum extraction rates. They might be dumping 15% of the uranium in the pond or something else as well. Um, you know, it's, you, what you're not, you're not trying to get over, what you're trying to do is to make the most money. You're just trying to get over that barrier where it actually becomes economic. Now, that mine, and they're now talking quite seriously, it's under 450 meters of overburden, barrel and they're talking quite seriously of open, open, open pitting that mine. Um, they're talking about uh, open pitting that mine. They, they're going to spend 10 or $20 billion just to remove the rock above it so they can go down and dig it. Uh, and you know, in the boom and bust cycles in the mining industry, there was a time when that was feasible. Now it's not feasible and they might come back to it. So there's a whole bunch of factors that go into when you do what, and when you turn on what type of process. So our process flow sheets don't even consider platinum, they won't go or anything else right now. We're just worried about water, hydrocarbon, nickel iron. Thank you. Okay, so anybody has a question? This thing is not long enough. Can you come kind of closer to here? Uh, sure, just line up here. Uh, um, if I remember correctly, there is this thing like a universal space treaty or some sort where basically no single entity or country can own privately and take part of the moon or the rest of the universe. Does this pose a problem to you and your goals? Yeah, th thankfully it's not the rest of the universe because I'd like to buy a house one day. Um, <laughs> at least on the ground, if not on the moon. Um, but no, the, the Outer Space Treaty is uh, 1967 is the uh, is the, the sort of one big international uh, piece of, of international law um, that that is that governs what nations do and how they do it, and uh, it requires that every country oversee the activities of its actors, of its individuals or companies. It forbids the country from appropriating or, or declaring sovereignty or anything like that on celestial bodies. It doesn't define what a celestial body is. If I can move an asteroid, then it's not real estate. Real estate is something you can't move by definition, terrestrial definitions. So there's a there's an option for interpretation. And all of these, this is, this is the law. It's all about how you intend to interpret it. Now in the Western system, or in the US and British and Australian and Canadian systems, uh, they're case law. So we have to a judge to basically make a determination of what that was. Um, in the Napoleonic Code, the French system, it's, it's subtly different. But because this is international law, you also have things like uh, um, customary international law, where if people just start doing something, then it kind of becomes law for people who've done it. And, um, and so there's a whole bunch of ways around that. So what the US has done last November, a law was passed that um, allowed asteroid mining companies to own anything that they extract, specifically US asteroid mining companies, it's a US law. Um, the response has been largely positive to that. Um, the Luxembourg and the UAE are known to be writing their own legislation, which is expected to mirror that fairly well. Uh, we know that there are discussions going on with other countries, there are high level discussions, there are um, international fora where lawyers get together and, and, and talk about that. And because there are now private companies in this space, the conversation has changed. So, um, so one, one thing is can you mine what you, can you own what you extract? The US law says yes. Second thing, and, and important for a mining company, is do you have secure tenure on the minerals that you've just proved out? You've invested an enormous amount of money, or you want to, to prove that these minerals exist and that this is a good place to mine. If you want to go and get that financing, no investor will put that money in and have someone come in and say, oh, that's great, thanks for that information, and take it. So secure tenure is, is an important part. Don't need ownership, it doesn't have to be permanent, a whole bunch of caveats on what that needs to be, but it needs to be a transferable asset. That the company can then buy and sell and list on a balance sheet. So that's something we expect will evolve out of the regulations. It's a tried and true part of, of all mining regulation on Earth. Um, so it's natural that that will happen. Um, we, we're waiting with bated breath to see what it actually will be. Uh, but it, it should be sold well before um, we're pulling the materials out of the asteroid. Uh, we expect it will be sold in the next couple of years. All right, so uh, in sci-fi land, there's utopian and, and dystopian sci-fi. And, you know, especially with asteroid mining and these massive solar uh, solar power arrays where you can harvest, you know, basically unlimited amounts of power, distribute it anywhere than on the planet instantaneously, it seems like a, a strategic imperative. 
for uh, militaries in you know on on one effort. Um, how do we how do we avoid bad things happening? Yeah, good question. <laughs> um, how do you avoid bad bad things happening in with any technology and, and with any context? Um, and, and the answers are, are difficult. And to be honest, the answers are political. And a lot of the reason we have uh, politicians is to help us not be at war. And sometimes they succeed. Um, the uh, and it's, it's one of the reasons I love the EU. They've been 100 percent successful in the only job that they have, and that's to stop another army marching across the continent, blasting everyone away. This is what they used to do every 50 years. And they haven't done it for 70 years, so go to the EU. Everything else might be is completely arbitrary. I prefer the bureaucrats to come and kill me with paperwork than for an army to come and kill me with a gun. Uh, and they went through a lot of that. So um, how do we how do we avoid that? Um, the Outer Space Treaty was written specifically to uh, alleviate that risk, uh, and that's why there's a lot of provisions like no appropriation and, and those kind of things. Um, so the, the nobody's ever broken treaty. a treaty. Sorry? But, but nobody's ever broken a treaty before. And that's, <laughs> and that's, and that's the careful balance that right, the world must, uh, you know, must navigate. So one of the things that, that we were very strong about when, we, when the, the US legislation was getting written, and, and we were consulted, as were other companies, um, we were very adamant that this had to not um, kick off an international backlash. So it mentions three times in, in it's only like 30 lines long or something. It mentions three times the Outer Space Treaty. And, and it's very deferential to the US's obligations under the Outer Space Treaty. And that, from our perspective, was quite important. And we can't take any credit for that. It was mostly the State Department and the US government, um, you know, the, 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 the staffers and the politicians who were, were negotiating that. Um, but that's important because then when it went out to the international community, there wasn't a backlash. Right? And that's, you know, you've not raised the temperature, you've not got the world any closer to run yet. Excellent. Everything that we have to do has to be mindful of that. So, you know, unlimited power and, uh, and everything else, um, we have to be very mindful. We have to put in place um, operational constraints. Uh, and those kind of things that are going to you know, check some balances that are going to limit the ability to, to A, to make any mistakes, B, to have any misunderstandings, and C, to, to understand when there might be actors who are trying to take advantage of a situation and to limit it. I can't tell you what those solutions are going to be, but being mindful is, is super important. One part that I will mention on this, which is slightly related, um, mining companies, when they go into a, a place to open a new mine, um, they're very cognizant these days that they need a social license to operate. Uh, and those words social license to operate mean that the, folk, the, the stakeholders, the, the locals particularly, but the community um, does not think it will and has, has effectively given them a license to come in and operate because you know, if they don't want you there, they will sugar down your gas tank or lock your gates or tie down a litigation and find a way to stop you. Uh, but if you go in and say, look, we'd like to go the mine. We think you've got something interesting under the ground here. We need to have workers at this mine, and we much prefer to have locals because they won't go away. We'd much prefer to have locals, we need to train them. So we're gonna build a school, and we're gonna train everybody so that some of you can work at the mine, and we're gonna bring in experts. But then we want external experts to come in and help you and help run the mine, and so we want them to be happy as well. So we're gonna build hospitals, okay? And we're gonna employ people in construction. And you go down the list of all the things that are going to happen, and say, okay, so would you like a mine? And if you explain this well, and you have uh, good intentions, and you've done your environmental impact, and, and you've, you've done everything properly, you'll get your social license to operate. The locals will say, yes, please, come and, come and set up the mine. And by the way, I like the idea of royalties. Uh, and, and that works out well. Our society, our, our community is global. And so one of the parts of getting a social license is to make sure that we are considering what the risks are, and that we're taking into account everything that we do, as well as explaining the benefits. And would you like a cell phone network drop from a geoconcept that's got a 100 meter diameter antenna? Okay, I can set you up a cell phone network in three minutes if there's any disaster. That's not a bad thing for the world. Okay, if we go as far as a space-based solar power, massive potential to uh, drop power in wherever it's needed. These are good things for the world. Yep. There's a whole bunch of things that, that are like that, that you know, it's our job to communicate and, and win that social access work. Thank you for the lecture. Uh,
mentioned uh, repeatedly and uh, dramatically how the company Octo and many other companies spend money fail, like another money uh, uh, business, how it's very uh, risky proposition. You mentioned that uh, better, easier way to make money. <laughs> Friends, uh, can you elaborate at which stage uh, and how they are failing uh, and how in optimistic scenario you expect not to avoid this way? Thank you. Yeah, great. You could ask that of any entrepreneur in any field. Um, so my first company, instrumentation for, for the mining industry, was terrestrial mining. Um, though the idea of a, a non-contact geochemical assay came from my work um, looking at uh, lunar and, and asteroid uh, surveys. Um, and companies fail for, for a lot of reasons. The reason that one failed was because the global financial crisis took the money out of the world. And uh, we had the biggest mining companies calling us, you know, asking and begging for this equipment because they had poor quality control of mines, they wanted, a, they wanted exactly what we're offering. And we said no to them because we needed to scale our, um, our system by three orders of magnitude. Uh, we thought it would take us a month or two, it was three months we called them back and it loaded up on debt. The, uh, the economy had changed and they were ripping themselves apart. And they wouldn't even give us enough money to move the equipment back to the university to keep the research going. Uh, so, you know, you run out of money, you start up, it's like running out of oil in the engine. It's not running out of gas, it's running out of oil. It seizes up. Everybody loses the company. We did well by everybody, we found the jobs. It, 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 worked out. it worked out okay for everybody involved but the company was not able to continue. That's just a, a risk of, of doing business, and that was a, a macroeconomic thing that blindsided us. It's, uh, it's important to try and figure out how many of those there are and try and mitigate them. There's a lot of risks all the way up and down this business. What we have done is build a business that has multiple revenue streams, um, that has redundancy in almost everything that we do, uh, from markets to products to management to the subsystems on the spacecraft, and you name it, we've tried to figure out what every single risk is and mitigate it. And that's all you can do, and then you push. If you're lucky, you end up in a place where the macroeconomic factors and technology and everything is converging, and you'll have a Google. The potential for what we're doing here, and the, the amount of material, to put this in context, there are some of the, some of the asteroids are, are made of nickel and iron. They're, they're, uh, the, the core of protoplanets that got smashed apart. I mean, blobs of nickel and iron are floating around, completely solid. Um, there, there are near-Earth asteroids, orbits near to the Earth, but uh, some of these metallic uh, asteroids are in the smallest ones, two and a half kilometers across. That asteroid contains more metal than has ever been mined in human history. That's a single two kilometer diameter metallic asteroid. There's enough material just in the near-Earth asteroids to support 100 billion people. And we're worried about running out of, running out of resources, which we talk about what running out of resources means, but we're worried about a resource situation. We can support 100 billion people just from the near Earth asteroids, and that's before you get out of the main boat. So it's not like we're sitting on a small opportunity here. Um, that's, that's why it's worth investing. But uh, in time frame you're talking about, yeah, quite likely to have an economic crisis. No? And some of the greatest companies in the world were formed during economic downturns. What you have to do is be lean, find your market, be very focused on your customers and your market, and figure out how to serve it. One line of business for us is, is microsatellites and nanosatellites and that technology. And we're very well aware that you know, we might be approaching the top of the cycle on that. That doesn't mean that there isn't an underlying trend. And what we have to be is robust to a contraction, but opportunistic for an expansion, and balance that. That's startup company 101, I think. Um, same for a lot of other things. I mean, our, our technology development, we're relying a lot on government money for things that we can't immediately make a profit of. And, uh, and that business is fairly stable. So we're happy that that business can, keep, can continue, but we need to transition things from that research track over to an internal development track as soon as we can see a market for the technology, or as soon as it hits that critical part. But we have that robustness to be able to, to put it back on a research track if we need to. I learned the lesson of the first company. <laughs> so you get an idea of some of the things. Yes. Very inspirational talk. Come to the beginning to the great 
Uh, do envision the future where we'll have some type of self-replicating station that will build, you know, the other uh, uh, mining uh, equipment that will be sent automatically to other uh, asteroids, uh, and we will have this scale, um, this avalanche effect. Do um, you do the, you know, and, and also a follow-up question would be: uh, Do we have an, uh, not enough, but um, all the variety of different uh, metals and uh, materials necessary to build um, you know, mining equipment, uh, maybe solar panels, or you know, for outside. <laughs> um, yeah, I can. I can answer the first. The, so the second question, really easy. Um, everything you find on Earth is in the atmosphere. The trick is mineral concentration. So on Earth, there's a hydrological cycle and volcanic activity, um, sedimentary activity. But those kind of things can drive different mineral concentration mechanisms. Um, on the asteroids, and there are 19 different uh, classes. We haven't gone out there and prospected fully. Expect to be surprised. Okay. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if anyone uh, remembers the, the massive crystals they found in, in the caves in Mexico. There are crystals 150 meters long, and enormous, enormous things found under the under the earth. Right? This is the earth. I thought we knew everything about this place. Right? A couple of years ago, they finally didn't blow everyone's minds. Okay, the asteroids have been they've been floating around for four billion years in a microgravity vacuum environment, in a in a very mild radiation field with a few magnetic fields. And what minerals do you grow there? If you get the the nickel iron meteorites, there's a there's a crystal pattern to them. That develops when you cool you know, nickel, uh, an iron alloy with 10 to 20 percent nickel at a few degrees per million years for 300 million years. Then you get that crystal structure. So we're going to be surprised by some really cool things. Hopefully, some really valuable things. That's the potential upside. But until we get out there and start doing it, we don't know exactly what's there. In terms of the minerals, because we have meteorite samples, we know a lot about about what we know enough. There's no problem building pretty much anything that we want. Uh, so, uh, this is really attractive to, uh, to uh, use whatever you have mined uh, up there uh, on, the, on the outlet or somewhere up there because now the, the prices are very high to, 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 to get them to there. But let's go back to playing on that. Uh, did you consider uh, let's call it blending? Landed uh, some asteroids somewhere in the middle of nowhere in the preserve, and uh, then use normal, uh, well, uh, modern Earth technologies for mining. Uh, does it does have any any economic sense? So we we did a lot of work on that before we set the company up. Um, different folks were in the company have looked at that question from from different angles. Um, there are bringing bringing stuff down has technical challenges, has political challenges. Um, environmental. environmental challenges. Um, it, it has the economic challenge of the price point and the fact that um, you're competing in a market with, with aggressive terrestrial operators as well. So we looked at it, we decided that it was sub economic, we found something that, that was a lot more attractive, and that's where we start. One day, when we've got the, the operations going, um, then we may tack, a, I mentioned before, we may tack a stage on the back that takes the output, which is because we've taken a lot of things out of it, it's upgraded in its platinum content, and we may decide that at that point we can both process platinum. Or we might find something that's so rich in platinum, as I mentioned, we'll be surprised that it makes sense. And uh, until we get there, we don't know. But um, I wouldn't hold my breath on those. I'd expect that to be 20 years away. So I had a question about when you're processing these asteroids that you bring in from orbit, wherever that is, whether it's near Earth orbit or higher orbit, where would you position asteroids starting from starting from the first one to building up of the scaling up that operation? Would you, for example, set aside the materials that you want to process for later on the moon or in a different pool? Waiting to be processed. 
So a couple of, couple of aspects to that. Um, just like uh, I mentioned the Olympic Dam mine, the uh, largest rare earth element deposit that put rare earth elements in the table mine, would have seen. Um, we'll probably find also uses for things perhaps as radiation shielding, ballast mass on the end of rotating objects, selling, who knows, we're selling cheap material. Nobody has thought about cheap material before. It's a completely, completely blows people's mind. I mean, if you really want to scare a, uh, someone who builds satellites, tell them you can provide them with tens of megawatts. I mean, nobody's had that power before. And if you put it into a ComSat, you'll just melt it. Right? We have to completely redesign the ComSat, which is why I mentioned that value chain study that we're doing and the technology that we need to build in order to get there. So there's a there's a paradigm shift that just you know, what is what is dirt worth in orbit when it's a waste product and, uh, and the cost of, of getting it to you is a drop or charge. Um, and then we can always come back and, and mine it again. Um, having said that, the process flow sheet at the moment is to do as much beneficiation, which means uh, uh, creating a concentrate at the asteroid, uh, and that way you have less mass to ship back. So there's a bunch of trades there. Um, second part was, uh, you, you mentioned the moon is a potential source. A lot of the technologies that we're building are applicable to any source of material. Um, we did a lot of looking at the moon and uh, came to the conclusion that right now, the asteroids are more perspective. Because of the, uh, the samples that we have from the meteorites, we have a good idea of the mineralogy uh, of, of materials that are of interest to us, uh, like water. Whereas on the moon, okay, the, the pole traps at the South Pole and the North Pole, uh, they might be as cold as 40 Kelvin where metals don't you know, behave like glass, um, which is very difficult. We don't know the geological context. There's a lot we have to learn about them. And uh, apart from that cold trap, um, it's it's difficult to, to, um, to we need a, a better understanding of other uh, mineral concentration mechanisms. We have 12 samplings from around the moon, um, maybe 14, I can't remember exactly how many the Russians got. Um, but we have a few samplings from the moon, uh, and it looks like a slag. And it's, it's what gets left over when you take all the good stuff out. Um, and again, that's, that's why the asteroids are not affected to it. Having said that, that could all change. A bit more geological work on the moon could completely change that. Um, if there's a, a move to invest in a, lunar, uh, a moon base, like the Europeans are talking about, um, that could, again, change the economics, change the viability, change the geological understanding. Uh, so nothing we're doing is exclusive. Um, we're not um, asteroid mining in deep space industry. So we'd be quite happy to use that piece of <laughs> Actually, that moon exploration was uh, was my uh, question. So, uh, uh, we can elaborate a little bit more about the feasibility analysis. For example, like, oh, yeah, there's no much uh, uh, meaningful material to be mined, but considering uh, considering the, like the technical viability, because. Uh, Everything. This is the whole picture. You have the uh, really consideration of that. <laughs> uh, you have the, um, the the profitability. You have the feasibility. You have the feasibility. So, for example, uh, moon. This is a known target. I know that's right. This is a, it's a further like the object is a further away to reach a very good point for your for your rover for your, your spacecraft to approach it. This is way more like a new magnitude more difficult than than the than landing something on a moon. So considering the technical difficulty being increased by that much, uh, so um, uh, the, the probability of being a you know, more mining might be worse, not so meaningful to uh, the asteroid. But what is the weighting uh, overall uh, optimization in our city? Yeah, so let me start by simplifying some of the things that you said earlier. We see five big risk areas. Um, geological risk, technology risk, market risk, financing, financing risk, is there enough risk capital with this appetite, and regulatory risk. And in the mining industry, that's called uh, country risk. So do you know what your tax rate is? Is it stable? Do you have a competent board? All that kind of so five, five risk areas. Um, when we look at the moon, I mentioned already the, the geological risk there is high because while we understand a lot about the moon, what we don't understand is any interesting mineral concentration mechanisms. Well, I shouldn't say any. We don't understand a lot of uh, concentration mechanisms. We don't have any samples of the South Pole um, and, and we, we, 
we're missing that material where we think the concentration is. Um, so there's a, a lot still to be learned. Whereas with the asteroids, we have a vast number of meteorite samples which we can match based on the spectrum. So we're confident that our um, geological models of the asteroids are um, sufficiently mature that um, it, it gives us a, a high level of confidence, a lower, a lower risk. Uh, you mentioned uh, access, and um, there are there are expected to be about 55,000 near Earth asteroids, so asteroids that approach within 0.3 AU of Earth's orbit, um, that are over 100 meters diameter. We know now of 15,000. Of the ones that we know of, 10% of those, about 1,500 of those, are energetically easier to reach than the surface of the Moon. They require less delta V. Some of them dramatically more. So it takes less rocket fuel, and if rocket fuel is money, and for the first missions, rocket fuel is money because you've got to launch it off the ground, then it's cheaper to get to the asteroids. You also don't have a gravity well, so you don't need to descend on a pillar of fire and have seven minutes of terror, or however you want to describe it. You just kind of dock with it. You mosey on up. And, um, and so that seems a little bit easier as well. But you don't have to have that entire stage. You just have a, a fairly low thrust uh, thruster system. So getting the material there, bringing the material back, it's cheaper and less technologically difficult, and we understand the geology better. All of those things push it in that direction. Now, I can give you a list on the other side. I don't have to because I'm promoting asteroid mining. But on the other side, I mean, there, there are pros to, to the moon as well, um, not the least of which is that it's three days away and it's always there. Um, but balance of things, we, we believe the asteroids are much more prospective right now. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, some more questions on this. Okay. Hi. Um, I just want to know what are the most top big challenges, technical challenges that you guys have on, on like, in the sheet? And um, are you guys having any plans on collaborating like, with organizations like NASA or like SpaceX on some of these uh, technical challenges? Biggest technical challenge, rock mechanics. The, uh, all the samples that we have have been you know, come through the filter, the great filter above us. Um, they've had to come in through the atmosphere and burn off their layers. So the odds are that the, uh, the asteroids are a lot more friable and, and there's a lot more soft material that just hasn't reached the surface. Um, some of the hardest rocks that we have are meteorites, but that's probably very much a selection bias. So we need to get to the bottom of that. Um, uh, and that's so that's that's our biggest question. How how hard is it to dig? What is the unconstrained compressive strength, porosity, grain density, grain size distribution? And there's a long list of things that, that we would wish that we had. Um, but then there's a there's a bunch of other questions. Um, the technology then related to that, you know, how do you how do you design equipment to dig that? Um, how do you design instrumentation to measure it? And that's a huge thing. And uh, we also need to know more about the technology and everything as well. But, uh, scientists are interested in mineralogy and develop a lot of, of good instruments for that. Scientists are less interested in rock camp, and therefore there's, there's a bit of dearth of instrumentation, uh, especially for the kind of missions that, that we're able to fly in very small space. Um, and then when we get into the process flow sheet, I mean, there's, there's 12 steps in the flow sheet, there's all the material handling steps as, as you get different products coming off at different stages. Uh, we've got to test all of those on the ground, and we've got to test them in microgravity. Um, there are some that are uh, that we're pretty sure we've, we've got leaked, and then there are some that aren't. And of course, we we'll build the equipment, and we'll find it gets hung up in a way that we didn't expect. We'll find that there are deleterious products that can poison the process. That some things are slower. That our extraction percentages are, you know, our, our yields are less than we wanted. Uh, we've got to work through all of that. Um, so, an example of the partnerships we're looking at. Some of that work on um, the process flow sheet stuff has been done already by a guy at Imperial College London. So we really want to partner with him. Um, the, there's a whole bunch of work being, that's been done at Kennedy uh, on uh, lunar regolith, and they're also very interested in asteroid regolith. Um, so University of Central Florida have some of that knowledge, and we've partnered with them to build asteroid simulator. Um, because there's not enough of the, of the friable, uh, uh, volatile-bearing type meteorites that we can have to first get the water out of, they deteriorate very quickly in an Earth environment. So you've got see the fireball race out over frozen lakes or desert or whatever it is and pick them up. So we've got a, about kilo, a kilogram of a two or three different subtypes of that. Uh, but we need tons to put through our, our process test, our, 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 
and processing equipment of, of our trial plants. So we're making asteroids in it. Um, NASA just bought four tons from us from about a million dollars. Uh, so NASA's also interested in this for testing their instrument and various things as well. But that's a partnership with University of Central Florida and, and Phil Metzger, who's you know, the genius out there on so much about um, how to work with, with rocks and, and those kind of materials in a, in a space environment. Um, so yeah, we're, we're actively looking for that. We're developing optical navigation system at the University of Luxembourg. Um, that's, that's a technology partnership. Um, yeah, we, we are supporting what a lot of other folks do, or at least promoting it. In, uh, uh, made in space, 3D printing, love what those guys are doing. And they're familiar with Acme Advanced Materials. Um, they've got a, a process for uh, a, a manufacturing process that has a step that requires a microgravity environment. They're trying to prove their technology out. If they can prove that, they may have cracked the nut on actually using space as a production environment. Then they'll need materials and things that's going on. It's, it's about this, this convergence. So there's a whole bunch of things that are happening on that side. Um, but yeah, our, our strategy is all about partnerships. So tell me what you do and I'd love to. <laughs> okay, the last question. <laughs> okay, one and a half questions. <laughs> yeah, and I'm fine with quick answers. Just a, I'm not sure I'm sure. Full of quick answers. Yeah. <laughs> So one is uh, quickly how does uh, wire propulsion work, and then the other one is really uh, on my mind quite a bit, which is um, going forward a couple decades or three, four decades from now, there's lots of companies doing what you're doing, and uh, it's a land grab, and there's the risk that the more irresponsible ones of them can uh, veer the trajectory of a asteroid in maybe in peril another planet or Earth. So, you know, yeah. speak to those. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, let me start with the second question. Um, so, what we're doing with the, the regulatory environment and looking at how uh, that all checks and balances is very important for that. Um, I'm not worried about a land grab. I mean, 1,500 near Earth objects that we know of that, that Meet our easy to reach and surface of the moon bar. And there's, there's I mean, the irresponsible behavior. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that's a matter of doing the right checks and balances and, and making sure that things are run well, um, just like any other industry that has the, uh, the potential for, um, for, for bad consequences on the earth, be it environmental or, or loss of human life or, or what have you. And there's a lot of industries that are. Well regulated and well this could this could wipe out a planet one Like so we're not proposing to move an asteroid. Uh, we, we want to bring back you know, maybe a thousand tons. No, but you should have rockets uh, attached to asteroids. Oh yeah, they're great artwork, isn't it? It's <laughs> <laughs> not happening. <laughs> no, that artist is fantastic. Uh, <laughs> and if we told them to take the rockets off, they would, but we'd love it. So we'd love it. Um, yeah, no, that's those rockets, uh, that equipment attached to the asteroid is extracting at that point. It then departs and uses those rockets to return. Those rockets trying to push that asteroid and you're not going to move. But all you have to do is change its trajectory. And then, and then wait for a very, very long time. Yeah, sure. Um, but you know, if we're tracking all of these things, we know where they are, we can see that they're changing. Um, and then we've got also the capabilities to respond. So you know, the best defense is being able to get a lot to respond to it. Yep. Um, but I, I want to be very cognizant that there are risks and the yep. And then I've forgotten the first part. Oh, the water thruster highways. So the one that we started with, it's an electrothermal thruster. It's basically a flying steam kettle. You superheat the water and put it out through a nozzle. It gives it about 200 seconds of ISP, which is better than a solid. Um, not as good as, a, as a most liquids, but um, decent performance. And it does the job that people want, which is to get their, their small spacecraft in the right orbit and then keep it all phased and do everything else. And it's easy, it's cheap, it's reliable, it's non-toxic, you can build a spacecraft around it without having to worry about catching fire. Really easy. Where we want to go with that is, as I mentioned, expanding the product line. Uh, we're talking to people who have thruster heads that can ionize the water and accelerate it or make a plasma or accelerate it by some other means. Uh, we're looking to do the feed system on the back end, which is non-trivial. They can do the accelerator end bit thruster, which is non-trivial, and marry it together with that bit of product. So we're working on the partnerships, wherever that was. Um, we're working on partnerships in that direction. Thank you. Um, electrical. <laughs> okay, if you can ask any other questions after we finish. Okay, last very short question. Thank you. 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 Th
thank you for allowing me. And uh, because I'm the last person asking this question, I also take this opportunity to thank uh, on behalf of our audience. Uh, it's a mind blowing session. Having worked as an engineering exploration production of the modern gas company, I kind of understand the value chain that you're talking about in terms of asteroid mining. And I know at this point it feels pretty unclear, quite challenging, but great potential. Uh, the question that I have is what is the manpower challenge that you're facing currently in terms of education, skill set? And also for somebody who's considering uh, their career in asteroid mining, what should be their path in terms of choosing uh, maybe their subjects or uh, what is the skill set that they need, they need to acquire? This is my question. Question specific, can you fire it? <laughs> so, have you ever done a probabilistic resource assessment? <laughs> have you ever done a probabilistic resource assessment oh, no, using the oil and gas standards? So, mining, um, mining was, uh, <laughs> it's, it's often speculative investment. And I mentioned mining, mining investors are used to, to dealing with that aspect of it, the uncertainty in the geology and the fact that you don't know what's there until you put a hole in the ground. And then you don't know what's around that until you put more holes in the ground. And they bet on that, right? And, and uh, the odds are that they will win, uh, but there's also high odds they'll lose. Uh, I once heard that uh, the definition of a mine um, is a liar, a thief, and a lawyer standing on a hole in the ground. <laughs> it's really uh, right to, to you know, exploit that. What the markets have done, because of course the investors don't want to get screwed like that. So what the, the markets now have developed is very standardized and mandatory reporting requirements. So in Australia it's called JORC, the JORC Joint Oil Resources Committee. In Canada it's NI43101, National Instrument 43101. It's very prescriptive on how you must disclose your data. You must say what analysis method you used, how you sampled it. It goes into a lot of depth. In Canada it's signed off by a uh, um, a professional geologist in Australia as well, signed up by a professional ge geologist, if they're making a false statement, you can sue them for the losses on the stock. So if you buy stock and it was, and, and, and they made a mistake on their resource assessment, they are personally liable. And they will, they will effectively be disbarred, they'll lose their name. There's a lot of, of requirements on professional geologists to do that. In the oil and gas industry, um, they do a probabilistic based uh, resource assessment, which we think is, is uh, quite applicable to uh, the way that we need to uh, to do resource assessments on asteroids. So we've talked with um, the, the committees that oversee um, these these uh, information disclosure requirements about adding an addendum for asteroid mining, both in Australia and Canada. Australians and Canadians run the mining industry, uh, and everyone sort of uses their their, um, uh, their their standards as the standards. So you get it into those, you're, you're in a good place. Uh, oil and gas, slightly different standard, very applicable. Uh, we want to bring all that together. Um, not enough people understand that in the world and understand asteroids. Um, so as that comes out, there can be few people who are able to do those resource assessments. So if you're a professional geologist, that would be really interesting. Um, you ask about manpower. So in terms of manpower, right now we're hiring engineers, we're hiring financial person, we've just hired BizDev. Uh, our short-term market is the, the Microsat Nanosat technologies, full spacecraft, those kind of things. Our goal is to get that resource assessment done, which is mostly a spacecraft problem. Um, a challenge there is to find people who understand how we build spacecraft. Uh, we're a little cultish about the way that we do that. Uh, we don't build spacecraft with the, the way that the big sat guys do. Uh, we don't build spacecraft the way that the CubeSat guys do. It's CubeSat compatible, so we can put together a CubeSat, but our philosophies and our approach is very different, it's very mindful of the risk at every single level uh, and how to mitigate that risk, even technical risk in this case. And, uh, and so we find we can either hire people who already get it, and there's about 25 of them in the world, uh, and we've already got uh, quite a number of those, <laughs> or we hire people who aren't yet, uh, who haven't yet got the culture of, of big space or CubeSat, and we train them. Um, so that's challenge because you know, we're running out of the of people who already get it, uh, and we're going to have to get into the training phase. Uh, there are some people who can cross over from those other areas and, and get the culture, but it's quite rare. Culture is hard to. to um, so that's one challenge. Um, yeah, as we as we grow, we're slowly hiring for different positions. We're very very picky about who we hire. Um, we, we guard our resources very very carefully. Um, so find a piece of this and excel in it. Um, make yourself a world leader, and, uh, and then it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you, Daniel, for the great job. So right now. Can talk about
conference yourself, you can talk to Daniel and drive it. And since we're doing everything for free, I would ask you guys can you help out to put the tables and chairs uh, without us out just to put it in the job. And again, thank you very much. And this is it.